Our gospel reading today is uh, from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 through 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Bread has been a staple of diets in the Western world for thousands of centuries. Every day, grains were ground into flour, batters mixed, and loaves baked at communal ovens. Bread baking was arduous, taking half a day or more. It was necessary, as bread was eaten at every meal. Indeed, regardless of the culture, bread making and water carrying were the two main activities that structured the daily routines of most women. Bread was such a significant food that every kingdom had rituals for giving thanks to their gods for the bread they ate. Indeed, in the Greco-Roman world that encompassed Israel at the time, the word bread was more commonly used to mean food than the word for food itself. Nowadays, even with the dietary trends shifting away from carbohydrates, we are still hooked on bread. Did you know modern farming yields about 48 bushels per acre or about one bread loaf of bread every 13 square feet? And in 19, uh, sorry, 2017, Kansas alone, which is the main uh, wheat producing state of the country, planted 7.6 million acres of wheat, which is only about 19% of our nation's total crop. One bushel yields enough flour to make 71 pound loaves of white bread or 90 one pound loaves of whole wheat bread. And did you know that every day, 50% of the people who live in the United States eat a sandwich? That's 166,583,625 people about, give or take one or two. Um, can, <laughs> You may imagine, as I have, that there must be thousands of stories about bread in every generation when you think about how long bread has been a staple of life for thousands and thousands of years. Just amazing. By show of hands, if you're willing, how many of you eat bread? How much bread do you eat every day? That looks like just about everybody, I think. Well, I have a bread story to share. We were a family that always made a penny stretch. And one summer when I was about six, my parents announced we'd go out on a picnic the next day. And whoa, a picnic. I was so excited and my three-year-old sister was so excited. We could hardly contain ourselves. And I got it in my mind that I would make the sandwiches. So early the next morning, I sneaked downstairs into the kitchen, and I climbed up on a chair, 
and humming away, I began to slather peanut butter rather generously on each slice. Just as I was about to get a second loaf, because of course sandwiches need tops, my mother came into the kitchen, and I will never forget the look on her face, and then suddenly her laughter as she swept me away from the mess I'd made and began scraping these gobs of peanut butter off the top of like 30 slices of bread. <laughs> and we were eating peanut butter toast for weeks. And every time she would laugh at me and it became a family joke. So I'm sure you have bread stories too. You might not have realized it, but somewhere in your memory bank, there's at least one. Is anyone brave enough to share this morning? No? Okay. Well, hang on to that story and share it now, um, today, or after church, with the, or later with your family, or jot it down and pop it in the offering plate on your way out. I'm guessing that for most of you, when you connected with your forgotten bread story, that it lifted your, little, your spirits a little. And that's the way it should be. Jesus has a few bread stories, too. In chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, we become immersed in it. It unfolds in three scenes. And about every three years in the church calendar, John chapter 6 is preached for about six weeks. <laughs> and so everybody gets their fill of bread. And these three scenes begin, one, the first on the steep slopes along the shore of Galilee, where at the end of a long day, Jesus' weary disciples want him to send away this crowd of 5,000 who've been following him. The second scene takes a place a few hours later when Jesus reaches Capernaum by boat only to find that many of the crowd had raced on ahead and are waiting for him on the shore. And the third is also on the shore in Capernaum and then in the synagogue there. Like a three-act play, Jesus engages and then challenges the crowd and then invites them, as he famously does, invites them right out of their comfort zone. What is happening here? This story is really a testimony of Jesus revealing himself as the Son of God, sent for the life of the world. It's a story about faith. We are called by the text to look and to believe. The story draws us through the three phases of Jesus' revelation. Unlike those following him that day, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of reflection. The text is a call to us to believe beyond our imagination's limits to the external nature of, a, to, sorry, the, to the eternal nature of a God who is love and would sacrifice all for the life of the world. It begins in that story we're all familiar with, the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus multiplies a few fishes and loaves. And that is the miracle we see in the gospel story, that multiplication, the feeding of all those people and having 12 baskets left over. But less visible is the miracle that is happening within the hearts and minds of the people who followed him. Jesus drew crowds when they did not know even why they came. Following him all day, they seemed, for instance, to have forgotten to eat. They hung on to his every word, soaking in his teachings, which healed and lifted spirits and brought the gift of hope beyond hope for timeless goodness into their lives and into the world. While on the shores of Capernaum, many thought to make him king, and Jesus refuses and retreats to rest and pray. 
as the evening falls, he goes by boat. I guess he starts over on the west coast there and heads over to Capernaum by boat, eluding those eager to hear more. But the zealous race ahead along this four or five miles of shoreline road to continue their questioning of him. When Jesus disembarks, they demand answers. They claim they need proof to believe Jesus, who, after all, is just a carpenter's son. No, they want a real sign that he is truly sent from God and has God's authority. Something like, they say, the manna from heaven that God provides mo through Moses when the Israelites were starving in the wilderness. Jesus calls them out saying that the fish and loaves they ate only filled their bellies. Now these complainers and grumblers were dismissive of the sign given when Jesus multiplied, blessed and multiplied the fish and loaves. And they never considered the spiritual starvation that the people suffered or their hunger for hope and healing. So Jesus tells them it is not he that, it, that uh, but the fish and loaves that, oh, excuse me, Jesus tells them it is not he that is like the manna, but the fish and loaves that, uh, that he multiplied. And they, that fish, those fish and loaves only last for a moment. The manna itself, like the fish and loaves, was gone in a moment after it was eaten. That's the nature of it. Food, our material food, is ephemeral. It comes and it goes. And those who eat only manna, who only eat the kind of food that goes on the table, will also die. And he tells them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. He is the true drink and the true food. It is not at all surprising that in that last scene, Jesus has shocked and confounded his followers who are thinking as they tend to do very literally, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Once again, those challenge, challenging Jesus see only what they want to see and, only, and hear only what they want to hear. And as graphic as this may have seemed to his followers that day, for eating flesh that uh, had not been purified, um, and certainly this image of cannibalism was like horrific to them. And it seems so to us in our English version of the Bible today, the translation today. It just doesn't do the text justice. For in this gospel, we find it over and over again, if you read the whole gospel of John, uh, the more difficult Jesus' language and uh, the more unbelief of his hearers and the more they're persistent in their unbelief, the more difficult Jesus' language and statements become. He's always upping the game. So when Jesus spoke about eating manna and the bread from heaven in the prior scene, uh, which was in verses 41 to 51, last week's uh, scripture reading, the writer used very few, uh, he used common words, estheo and phago, both in biblical Greek mean to eat or take food as in a meal. But abruptly here in verse 53, when Jesus speaks, he switches to the less common word, trogo, which is used in the Bible only in John 6. Trogo has a double meaning, to munch or gnaw like an animal uh, at, at something. And then it's used only in the present text, which connotes a continuum, ongoing action, and slow process. It is also used 
with the double meaning of the custom of eating in certain company. Thus, when Jesus said, he who eats, that is trogo, this bread, will live forever, it means a continual feeding, something that is to be done on a consistent basis to satisfy the spiritual appetite. And by use of the word trogo, he also emphasizes that Jesus himself is the food that endures to eternal life, and it implies an ongoing behavior of both eating of and eating in company with Jesus. Now, Jesus knew that the world needs people who have come alive. Time and again, Jesus taught and modeled how to live closer to God. And in chapter 6 of John, the foundation is laid for us. Jesus brilliantly provides us with, with the most graphic, but also the most simple and most extraordinary means of remembering his teachings. He teaches us that life is not merely a state of breathing and consciousness and routine and looking at the surface of things. He knew that people had a tendency to forget the intent of God's will and that God's will is not merely to sustain life as manna was used in the wilderness, but to be life-giving. He made the ordinary extraordinary so that we might remember him in the every day of life, in the mundane and mind-numbing and body-exhausting tasks of routine, to remember him as a life-giving and, and life-sustaining force in the world. He wanted us to trust in God and live knowing that we have been saved he wanted us to embody him, to internalize his teachings, and to keep him as a guiding light, to keep our minds and hearts turned to God and in God find strength. Heavenly life is not a far-off distant dream for Jesus, but is near to every person here and now. When we allow the chains of our convictions to bind us to the very structures that trap us in our own self-righteousness, we no longer seek being right with God. And we pass up the bread of life as his followers did that day and look only for the manna of heaven when we need it to get through a crisis. Faithful people, we no longer need to look for this temporary manna, for Jesus offers himself as the word made flesh, the bread of life. When Jesus tells us those who ate manna died in the wilderness without entering the promised land, but those who eat the bread of life now will live forever, he leaves the decision to us as to whether or not we remain in the past or whether we will participate in God's new action in the world. Let us silently reflect for a moment. Where do we, in our daily lives, turn a blind eye to our spiritual hunger and instead satisfy cravings we've been conditioned to desire, leading us to overspend, overeat, or expect something in return for all we do, or to obsess negatively about the world. Jesus sets the example and shows us the way. He tells us, for I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And that's John 13, verse uh, 15. Jesus makes it possible for every person to connect with him and to share God's love of humankind with others whenever we break bread, making it easier for us when he called us to a new law. A new commandment I give to you, love one another. 
as I have loved you, so must you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. When we eat of the living bread, Christ fills our hearts with his love and nourishes our souls. He lifts us up. Let your love of Christ flow through your veins and his light shine before you so that they may see your good heart and draw others to him. Because we are human, we will inevitably falter. So Jesus makes us his body, binding us to him as hand and belly are bound to head. And by giving us the bread of life, he draws us into fellowship, first as his body, the church, so that together we may find the strength to live righteously, that is, turn to God in the horizon of God's kingdom. And it is by your belief in him that you are joined and transformed here on earth to be his body. You become and are now, as Christians, part of a new humanity. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So when you are having your morning toast or bowl of cereal, when you're eating a sandwich, taco or wrap, when you're sopping up your spaghetti sauce with a slice of bread or enjoying a snack of crackers and cheese, Remember, Jesus, the bread of life, wants to be there with you, and he is there with you. And give thanks. And whenever you're feeling fatigued or grumpy or lonely, or when you're dining with friends or surrounded by the wild and wonderful chaos of family, or when you are at a loss of what to do or bursting with ideas, pour yourself a glass of water and water your spirit, remembering Jesus' words, draw your comfort and strength and joy and patience from him, the living water, the bread of life, and give thanks. Amen. <laughs>